someone who uh, worked with him. Cassatt seemed to grasp the whole situation in a few hours, and in a day or two after he'd gone over the railroad, he knew more about it that we, than we did, who had been here a year. So he was a very quick study, he moved up the ranks, and it was actually Cassatt who had extended the Pennsylvania Railroad lines to Jersey City in 1871, and had developed this entire system of New York ferries, which he found intolerable. Uh, why? Because their chief rival, the New York Central, owned by the Vanderbilts, came in in very nice style to Grand Central Station. So the Pennsylvania Railroad at this time was considered one of the, the great American corporations. It was capitalized at $400 million in 1877 and had 20,000 employees. So it was a very big player. Um, so, um, This is Pittsburgh, and this plays a very important role in Cassatt's life. This was, as you can imagine, for the Pennsylvania Railroad, a very uh, major part of its uh, customer base. This is the era of Carnegie, of Frick, of Westinghouse, and enormous amounts of industrial production that is being carried by the railroad. It's also a scene of a very pivotal moment in Cassatt's professional life. So in 1873, uh, the United States suffered a terrible depression, and by the June of 1877, Tom Scott is president, um, and there is this system where big customers are asking for secret rebates, and they're getting them. Standard Oil starts to become a big customer, and they want this also, and Scott is trying to resist this because it's you know, they're suffering a lot in this depression. So in order to resist this, he decides the solution is to cut men's wages and increase their work, which had been done a number of times already. And so um, the men were very angry about this, and they began to block the trains. Cassatt was the only member of management willing to go to Pittsburgh, and uh, he called in the militia. This had a very bad uh, response on the... Uh, night of July 21, these angry men became angry mobs, and um, they promptly torched everything that belonged to the Pennsylvania Railroad. 39 buildings, 104 locomotives, 46 passenger cars, and then they looted 1,000 uh, freight cars. This turned into the Great Strike of 1877, spread all over the country. Um, Things eventually calmed down, but for Cassatt, he had seen and realized that when powerful corporations pushed their men too far, uh, things could really uh, spiral out of control. He also then, Standard Oil got its secret rebates. Everything about this, Cassatt thought was wrong. So um, several years later, Tom Scott resigns his office under a cloud, and he dies very shortly thereafter. The Pennsylvania Railroad then chooses a much more prudent man to run the railroad. You see him on the right, George Roberts. And you just look at these two pictures, and you see two different very personalities. So uh, by now, Cassatt's family, including his sister, the artist uh, Mary Cassatt, are living in Paris. And in 1881, uh, his mother, now this is a self-portrait by Mary Cassatt of herself and a portrait of her brother that she did, and she writes to Cassatt and she says, how do you manage with Roberts as chief? I don't think you like the idea of serving under him. Please don't put off resigning too long. Remember the fate of your predecessor. So Tom Scott had just died, and it was very much a tradition of uh, presidents of the Pennsylvania Railroad to die in office or very shortly thereafter because it was such a demanding job. And Cassatt was quite unhappy because he felt that he should have been made the president. So in September of 1882, at age 42, he does resign and retires, but he remains on the board and he has a you know, very in, sort of interesting life. He runs some small railroads, he's a big horseman, and he is in Europe quite a bit visiting his family. Okay, so now we will meet Samuel Ray, our other um, major figure and hero in all of this. His story is very different than Cassatt's. He came up in very humble circumstances in Hollidaysburg. 
uh, Pennsylvania, uh, born in 1855. His father died when he was 13. He left school and he went to work on local farms. But like many young, ambitious men of the time, he yearned to be with the railroad. And by age 16, he had managed and he'd come on also as a rod and chain man uh, in 1871. Now, unlike Cassatt, he did not have a powerful uh, mentor, but he was moving up slowly. This is him at a later age. Made it to Broad Street to management, but he was frustrated, and he resigned in 1889 at age 34. He becomes president of the B&O Railroad. This is their fabulous building in Baltimore. And um, he helps them to build the B&O Belt Railway. And in many ways, this is very handy to him later. After two years, he resigns. He's not in very good health. He recovers from whatever it was that ailed him. And very unusually for the Pennsylvania Railroad, they asked him to come back, and he did. So um, meanwhile, George Roberts dies in office, and he is replaced, and this is 1897, by Frank Thompson, who you see here on the left in the dark suit. Um, and he becomes the Pennsylvania Railroad's sixth president at a time when the nation was really booming. And in this case, what was happening to the railroad, it was just overwhelmed by the demand for shipping for all of this industrial boom. And so they had a lot of very unhappy customers as trains were just not moving or were sidelined, didn't get unloaded. Tom Thompson lasted two years. This is a very crushing job. He lasted two years, and he was dead. So <laughs> it's 1899. Alexander Cassatt has been on the board all this time. He's 60 years old, um, but he's been out of office. And the board now comes to him and asks him, will he become president? Um, and he sees this as a chance to put a lot of things right that he thinks are wrong with the way the railroad is run. And he tells the board, I will take this job, but it will entail a swift and monumental expansion that you cannot interfere with. And Ray is made the fourth vice president. Ray is now 44 years old. So both of these men, uh, when Cassatt was on the board and Ray is in management, have been working all these years on this problem of how do we get into Manhattan? So if you look, you see there's the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, ferries still across the Hudson River, but they are now determined to do something about this. So one thing they think is not feasible is to build tunnels. And the reason is because in the 1870s, Colonel Haskins um, had built, started building tunnels, a, a tunnel under the river, and it had just been a disaster. 20 men had died, there were all kinds of problems, and finally he gave up. So there was this abandoned tunnel under the Hudson River, you know, deep in, in the riverbed. So it was widely believed that you could not safely or even effectively build tunnels under the Hudson River. So the solution was this $100 million North River Bridge. It would have 14 tracks for railroad trains and trolleys, it required a federal franchise. What that meant is all the other railroads that stopped at the Jersey Shore, of which there were about 10, in the opinion of the Pennsylvania Railroad, would of course pony up to help build this fabulous um, piece of railroad structure. Uh, but actually, the attitude of the other railroads was, well, we all know the Pennsylvania Railroad is desperate to get in. We don't really care that much. They have a lot of money. So go ahead, build a railroad. We'll all use it. Uh, Cassatt and Ray did not see it that way. So to quote Ray, matters were therefore at a standstill. The inability to carry out the scheme was a severe disappointment. So what happens now is uh, Cassatt happens to go to France to visit his sister, and while he's there, he goes to the, the Gare d'Orsay, where he encounters these electric uh, trains that are running in a tunnel that's not under the river, but alongside the river. And so he starts rethinking the tunnel thing. And he is aware that there's an uh, English tunnel engineer named Charles Jacobs who had successfully built a gas tunnel under the East River. So he goes to London, gathers up Jacobs, and brings him back to Manhattan where he puts him out on the river where he secretly at night is doing the studies to see if, if tunnels are feasible. So uh, Jacobs 
seems to feel that it is feasible, and so Cassatt is quite excited about that, but he needs to get some final details. If you're going to build a tunnel, it means you're going to have to get a franchise through the city council or the aldermen, as they were known there. So, uh, and that has its own set of problems. And I should say that Samuel Ray is in charge of this project. Um, and if they're going to do this, it's going to have to get through these two men. Um, on the left is William Croker, one of my favorite characters in this entire book. I actually almost couldn't believe what I learned about him. So he was the head of Tammany, Boss Croker, and he'd become so rich off of graft that he'd moved to England where he had a castle, racehorses, he had pigs he named after politicians he didn't like. He ran Tammany by telegraph. He only came back to New York for scandals and elections. Boss Croker. Uh, and I should say that Tammany always expected to be well paid for anything major that happened. So the Brooklyn Bridge, they were paid about $65,000 in bribes or boodle. Um, the other important person on the right is Thomas Collier Platt. And he was the Republican state boss. And both he and Boss Croker hated reformers. And Platt, with great reluctance, had allowed Teddy Roosevelt to become the Republican governor of the state. Um, and he got rid of him as fast as he could by making him vice president of the United States. Um, Platt, of course, lived to serve big corporations. And so he would be highly friendly to Cassatt. Um, and remember, Cassatt is a person who has, um, believes in a certain amount of transparency and fair dealing. And I should say that almost the first thing he did when he became president of the railroad was to end the secret rebates. It was very unpopular with people like Carnegie. Um, so the political situation was far from ideal, but then, um, Cassatt had a very, oh, well, so the, that's bad. He finds out something that's almost worse from uh, Charles Jacobs, which is that Cassatt had envisioned building his station in these rail yards that he had control of. But what he found out from Charles Jacobs is the only place that they could build the tunnels based on grade and the weight of the locomotives was in Manhattan's worst vice district, the Tenderloin known as Satan Circus. This was uh, where all the whorehouses were, the dance halls, saloons, opium dens, and dangerous criminals, and they needed to buy 28 acres. So um, this was going to have to be done very secretly and quietly. Uh, so they've got, they've got a number of major hurdles, and then they have a very good stroke of fortune, which is that Tammany sort of overstepped itself and um, managed to double the price of ice and have this come out publicly, which very much affected their voting block, the poor. And so the poor did not vote for Tammany in the next mayor election. They voted for Seth Lowe, a reformer, which gave Cassatt um, an ally who also believed in um, not bribing uh, Tammany because Cassatt had made this decision that he was not going to pay what they were asking, which was about $300,000. And you will see, uh, so this is Cassatt, and I always love this picture because to the left of Cassatt is someone who comes right off the Monopoly board. Doesn't he look just like the capitalist? <laughs> it's really, um, there are very, very few pictures of Cassatt, and it sort of gives you sort of a sense of him. And as you will see from this wonderful political cartoon, um, he was successful in not paying any bribery to the Tammany Tiger, as it was known. Uh, and so they are the tunnel and this vast project. So they're coming through the Bergen Hills, a mile tunnel through these very difficult hills, a mile under the Hudson River, two tunnels, Penn Station with the trains coming in 50 feet below the station, then two tunnels out to the uh, East River, and then four, long, and four tunnels underneath, uh, two for the Long Island Railroad and, and two for the Pennsylvania Railroad. It's the biggest civil engineering project of his time, never referred to as such or referred to at all by the, by the Pennsylvania Railroad if they could manage it, because their tax, their um, stockholders 
hated this project because it spent too much money. As far as the stockholders were concerned, ferries were fine. So they've gotten this land uh, with, in great secrecy, and they're beginning to tear down everything in the Tenderloin. Why is this building still there? It's a bar. There's a lot of workmen. So uh, in early 1902, uh, Cassatt appoints a board of engineers. And if you look to the second man in from the, the right is Charles Jacobs, uh, who is a you know, very major figure in all of this. Uh, April 23, 1902, Charles McKim of McKim, Mead and White is, uh, wins the commission, is very highly sought after. McKim had never designed a train station, but he certainly had designed lots of New York buildings and he totally understood the monumental. So we're now clearing the 28 acres. They're using these little locomotives. They haul everything off to these piers, gets dumped into barges. Uh, I mean, this is just a monumental thing. It becomes known as the Panama Canal of New York. You see from this uh, painting, they're propping up streets, they're propping up the elevated trains, they're propping up utilities. I mean, it is a great show. The tunnels are being dug simultaneously from both banks of the rivers, and they're using these 193-ton great head shields. They have these nine compartments, the sand head, Hogs go into them, and they push them ahead two and a half feet each time, and the sand hogs then you know, uh, attach all of these segments. The big issue, as you can imagine, is they have to meet up perfectly under the riverbeds. So everything is about aligning. So this is the aligning team, and it's, it's all 40 feet, at least in the Hudson River, it's 40 feet below the riverbed. So uh, there were many accidents. All of this is done with compressed air to keep the water out, which means all kinds of issues with the bends, all kinds of issues with leaks, floods, fires, um, very little of it ever seen by the public. In this case, uh, this is the Weehawken Yards, and the tunnel uh, manages to collapse everything above it. So uh, during this time when they were building the tunnels, there was a terrible telescoping, telescoping accident going into Grand Central. And for any of you, which I imagine is many of you who have been through what are now known as the Amtrak tunnels, you notice these very high sidewalks. Those were designed by Cassatt to keep telescoping from happening in the train tunnels in case there were accidents. So everything's moving right along. And uh, by 1906, um, the first of the tunnels meets, and standing here looking very pleased with himself in the middle with the top sort of the flat hat is Charles Jacobs. Things are getting deeper and deeper. Okay, so now what about the post office, which figures so big today? So in 1903, uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad proposed, which carried 40% of the U.S. mail, said to the U.S. government, we think this would be an ideal place to put a post office, and we know that you're trying to open one in New York. So um, I have not mentioned that all of this real estate was acquired under the direction of a man named Douglas Robinson, who was the brother-in-law of Teddy Roosevelt. So he's very well politically connected. Goes down in 1903 to Washington, and I, this is, a, to me, a hilarious letter he writes back to Cassatt about why nothing is happening. And some kind of a bill had gone to Congress where it was just languishing. And Robinson writes to Cassatt about this bill. It must go back to Congress, and 400 congressmen must be convinced the government had found a gold nugget for nothing in the street. If you want them to take your site, put as low a figure as possible, even at a loss to you. So that was 1903, March 1906. You see nothing has happened. They're still not interested in buying this site. So um, I should say by the summer of 1906, Cassatt is not well, and this is a portrait of him by Sargent, and in December of that year, he dies, uh, which was actually quite a shock to everyone, including Samuel Ray, who wrote this very sweet uh, condolence to um, Cassatt's widow. 
He was an extraordinary man, one so noble and inspiring, I have never had so much pleasure in my life as my seven years of association with him. So this was front page news all over America uh, because this was sort of like the Steve Jobs of the day. I mean, the Pennsylvania Railroad was considered, they considered that everything they did, they did with great excellence. They were always at the technological cutting edge. Um, and they saw themselves as a force for good, and they referred to themselves as the standard uh, railroad of the world. And in the New York Times obit, they noted that in this era of Robert Barons, that Cassatt was somewhat unique in believing that co corporations should, quote, deal candidly, fairly, and honorably with the public. So the new president of the railroad was a man named James McCray. He knew nothing about this project. And so from here on in, Ray is really on his own and completely in charge. So by 1908, uh, the station is swiftly rising in uh, this still not great neighborhood. I mean, they've acquired and cleared these 28 acres, but you know, the Tenderloin is still around. Uh, there is some good news that the uh, government has finally agreed to buy the site, and not only that, they have agreed to uh, use the same architects, McKim, Mead, and White, so that the, that the post office and the train station would, uh, you know, kind of be in sync. So there were many celebratory dinners. Everything's moving along. This man with the mustache and bald head, that's Charles Jacobs. 1910, the station is finished. As many of you probably know, it's modeled in part on the baths of Caracalla. So if you look at the clock, just notice these teen little figures of night and day. We'll see one of them again. Uh, this is the interior of the Charles McKim, of McKim's general waiting room, the biggest room in the world at the time. Has no chairs, so you can't really wait in it. Um, and I'm just gonna read you this little snippet of Thomas Wolfe uh, from You Can't Go Home Again that gives you sort of a feeling of this space. Young, old, rich, poor, Jews, Gentiles, Negroes, Italians, Greeks, Americans, they were all there harmonized and given a moment of intense and somber meaning as they were gathered in the, into the murmurous, all-taking unity of time. So Ray insisted that there would be a statue of Cassatt uh, to stand overlooking the interior of his great work. And um, I would just like to say here that this statue has uh, been sta standing for some time on the inside of the Pennsylvania Railroad Museum in Strasburg, Pennsylvania. And I personally would like to say right here now, it needs to come back. <laughs> yes. Um, so the, the station opens uh, to the public November 26, 1910 with these uh, electric locomotives. Without them, everyone going through the tunnel would be asphyxiated. Two years later, 1912, Samuel Ray becomes president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Five years later, he opens Hell's Gate Bridge. 1917, this is the final part of this huge civil engineering project. So this was my fourth book, and it was the first and only book where I've learned secrets. So the first is this very sad one. And I learned this from the descendants of Samuel Ray. There is nothing in writing about it. Um, his son went to Princeton. He was a young engineer, and he was among the hundreds of engineers who worked on these tunnels, which were full of bad air. Many people died working on these tunnels, and actually no one knows how many because the Pennsylvania Railroad was not keeping track. Um, he contracted pneumonia, and he died. And this is his uh, tombstone, this was 1908, leaving a widow and a young daughter. And he was buried in the same cemetery as Cassatt at the Church of the Redeemer in Bryn Mawr. Um, the other far more consequent secret, because it affected far more people, is that they agonized over whether the tunnels were safe. And honestly, they were not going to know until the train started running in them. So that was a huge struggle. So uh, Ray also got a statue, and many of you maybe have seen it. Uh, it has been consigned 
to the outside of the station on 7th Avenue where he's been watching taxis go by for years. I think the man deserves to come back inside. Um, and as many of you also know, um, and I should say also that Samuel Ray was that rare Pennsylvania Railroad president who retired and was still alive um, in 1925 at age uh, 70. So um, the, building, the station building started being torn down October 28, 1963, and it took several years. And this is the statue of Day um, in the Meadowlands. OK, so now we're going to have a very quick um, side trip to the 21st century and um, urban infrastructure as we think about it today. So this is my current book. What is an urban forest? A lot of people think it's kind of an oxymoron, so there you go. It's all the trees in the city uh, around you. They make up the urban forest. And uh, when America began to urbanize, the original advocate for having trees um, was Andrew Jackson Downing, who many of you would know is one of the man who brought Calvert Vaux here back from England, and also was one of the original advocates for the idea that eventually became Central Park. So uh, he led, he was one of the first leaders of the, what I would call, first urban forest movement. It was very successful. America ended up with lovely tree canopies in its cities. And then after World War II, between Dutch elm disease, the fact that many trees that had been planted when cities were first developed were dying, the coming of the car, um, development, parking lots, all this sort of stuff. So one of the arguments in the first urban forest movement was that trees were really essential to public health. There was no air conditioning. They helped cool the cities. And there was also a lot of, there were many animals, you know, horse-drawn whatevers, and a lot of animal droppings that dried and went into the air. And the public health boards uh, viewed the trees as important for sort of absorbing all this, you know, unhealthy particulate matter. So after World War II, we now have air conditioning and we have modern medicine. So how are you going to justify at a time when cities are on hard times having uh, urban forests? And so there begins this big scientific, technologically based push to try and figure out what are the ecosystem services that are being delivered by trees um, by urban forests. And uh, it really begins in a serious way in Chicago in 1994. And now we're going to fast forward very quickly to New York uh, because trees are now being reg recognized as green infrastructure and you can measure what they deliver. So you see this for every dollar spent on a New York City street tree, you're getting 560 in city services. 1.73 pounds of air pollution is absorbed by trees. When all that water comes down and you've got all these you know, sewers and stormwater issues, they're absorbing 1,432 gallons. So there's a lot of benefits that come from trees. And the software, uh, which is from the U.S. Forest Service and Davy Tree, it's available, public domain, has re is really transformed what you know about urban forests, how they're managed, and how you can quantify their worth. So all of this was extremely uh, persuasive to Michael Bloomberg. We all know he's a big data guy. And he consequently quadrupled the forestry budget in this city and launched the Million Trees NYC. Uh, de Blasio has been equally supportive. So um, you know, you really have to see trees in a very different light. And uh, this is a more recent thing that gives you a sense of all the ways that trees are being extremely hardworking civil servants. The other thing that's very interesting is, once again, we are learning that trees are essential to public health. So there's a lot of very compelling scientific research going on. And essentially, just looking at a tree, being around trees, brings down your cortisol levels, which are markers of stress, which are part of what makes you uh, better or worse uh, in terms of your health. So just very quickly, a healthy urban forest is a good economic investment, and trees are essential to public health. Um, so now we're back to train stations. So as uh, many of you may remember, and I'd like to point out all, all the trees in this rendering, um, Back in 1993, the current Penn Station, which is a miserable 
worse than a bus station practically. Uh, the Farley Post Office was going to be used less and less, and so uh, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan proposed creating, using this McKim, Mead, and White building as a new station. And there was a lot of enthusiasm. So that was 20 years ago. And uh, lo and behold, after many starts and stops and starts and stops, as of a few months ago, we're actually, it's actually happening. Um, I was there this morning with Lorraine Deal, another Penn Station author, and we got a tour of the Moynihan Train Hall, which is in a great state of construction. But this is what it's going to look like. Um, and a part of it is actually already open in the bottom. I had no idea. So this is all looking very splendid, and we'll have this large uh, interior, lots of interior light. So, what are the present dreadful Penn Station? This lovely uh, rendering of what it might be is done by architect Vishan Chakrabarti, who is with us, and he and I are about to sit down and talk about Penn Station. So, thank you so much. He does a lot of this. <laughs> so um, I did not realize until today that Vishan has actually been involved in things to do with Moynihan Station for a very long time. Yes. So I'm, I, I'm actually going to ask you to maybe describe a bit of your own background and how you came to make this very beautiful um, design, and then where are things going from here? Okay. And well, what's going on? <laughs> okay, well, thank you. First of all, I just want to say it's an incredible honor to be on stage with Jill. Uh, the plan that you saw was deeply influenced by, I contacted, Jill, Jill didn't know me from Adam. I sent her an email. I said, could you help me try to understand this? And she immediately wrote back, came to my office. And also uh, the late, great Hillary Ballin, who, who was very supportive as well. So it's wonderful to be here. Um, uh, so I'm an architect and urban planner, uh, have worked in architecture in the city for almost 25 years now, worked as uh, Mayor Bloomberg and Amanda Burden's uh, Manhattan director, uh, Manhattan planning director after 9-11. And uh, we did a lot of the planning for the west side, the High Line, Hudson Yards, and Penn Station was always the hole in the donut. It was always the impossible thing to try to figure out. People have, as you said, been trying for many years. Um, Senator Moynihan, for whom this Farley project is named, uh, started that project, I think, in 1993. Uh, and it's wonderful that it's finally getting going. So it's great that you and Lorraine were there. Um, the struggle with it is that um, what I don't think was entirely clear to people is that um, as Jill went through that extraordinary history, um, the Farley building sits on the far west side of the tracks. And so it's really being built as a station primarily for Amtrak users and for some commuters, maybe Long Island Railroad, who are headed westward. So on its best day after it's open, it will serve about 20% of the people who use Penn Station. And that's a, a very significant number. It's not, you know, it, and it's great that the government's advancing that. The problem is, is that, and just picking up a little bit where your history um, kind of left off, is that Part of why, and Jill knows a lot more about this than I do, Penn was uh, uh, demolished, of course, is because Penn Central Railroad is on the verge of bankruptcy when it makes that decision. Uh, air rights. Right, air <laughs> rights. Because what's happened, um, Eisenhower passes the Federal Highway Act in 54. People, especially wealthy people, are no longer taking trains to go from city to city. And so Penn Central's main business is basically undermined. Uh, but what we tend to forget about that story is by the 50s, Levittown has been built, suburbanization's happening all over the country, and commutation in the station, even though uh, the, the Penn Central's riders have come way down, the number of commuters moving through the station is extraordinary. Uh, probably about 200,000 a day when the station was demolished. That number today is 650,000. 
It is the busiest transportation hub in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, just to give you a sense of scale, about 170,000 people a day move through Heathrow Airport. Um, and so when you think about that magnitude of use, uh, so if you take 20% of those people, put them in the Farley building, they now have a much nicer experience, you're left with a half a million people a day still in the basement of Madison Square Garden. Right, that, and that's the fundamental problem. And so what's happening is uh, Farley is advancing, but there still seems to be no light at the end of the tunnel, if you'll excuse the pun, for those half a million people a day who are primarily the commuters, primarily less wealthy than Amtrak riders, um, and uh, people who deserve, I think, a much better kind of lot in life than what they have today. And um, so for me, and I'll sort of stop here and let you let the conversation continue, I think this comes down to three things. I think it comes down to capacity, safety, and dignity. Uh, and right now, the station lacks all three. Uh, capacity. Uh, Jill went through the extraordinary tunnel, and if you haven't read Conquering Gotham, you must, of the construction of those tunnels. Um, some of you may know that those tunnels were damaged during Superstorm Sandy. Um, they need to take them out to properly repair them, which means that you need another set of tunnels, which is the, probably the top infrastructure project in the country right now in terms of what needs to get built. It's a some $20 billion undertaking. We do things, thank God we do things in a way that's safer today and environmentally more friendly, but obviously much more, uh, much more costly as a consequence. Um, we need those two tunnels. Uh, groups like the Regional Plan Association, others have been fighting for it, Senator Schumer, Senator Booker, everyone understands that if one of the two tunnels under the Hudson Rivers were, were to go out, you wouldn't lose 50% of the capacity under the Hudson, you'd lose about 70 to 75% because you'd now be running trains in both directions. That would cripple the Northeast economy. The Northeast economy represents about 20% of the GDP of the nation. Um, so this is a very, very big deal. So in terms of capacity... Nonetheless, there is no financial arrangement as we speak. Right. They're trying. They're trying. And supposedly, I mean, there's some other things going on in Washington, but supposedly they're trying. Um, so that would bring new tracks, new, tu new tunnels, and, and so new capacity, and we need that. We're, we're growing. We need that capacity. Safety. Um, there was a stampede in the existing Penn Station uh, last summer. 14 people were hurt. Um, that was a sort of, I, I, I don't mean to diminish what happened to those 14 people, but it was sort of a nothing event. It was a false alarm, basically. God forbid anything real happened in that station. Uh, I'm an architect, I don't want to talk about, I don't want to alarm people. At the same time, we have to face the fact that a station that was built for roughly, and you probably know this number better than I do, probably about 120,000 people a day is processing 650,000 in a lightless space in a space where you can barely make your way out when there's not an emergency. Um, and so getting light and wayfinding and proper fire egress, the, the image Jill showed of that openness all the way around. King's Cross, if you're familiar with King's Cross Station in London, they had a, they, they were, that station was attacked on, during the big day of the London terrorist attacks um, several years ago, and this is one of the things they did. They actually made the station passively heated and cooled, which meant you could get rid of a lot of the doors. It meant that the fire egress was a lot safer. And then dignity which is something that we don't talk enough about in our society, I feel like, in terms of... You don't of like having a rugby <laughs> scrum when you get on the train? <laughs> don't mean, you have any sense of, I don't know, you know, athletic <laughs> you know what amazes, challenge? You know what amazes me is you look at Jill's slide. The, the sense of public dignity we had 110 years ago, right? That we said, and I don't think this was a left thing or a right thing. I think it was just a kind of, we were a society that built great things. And we said, you know, there's going to be massive disruption and people put up with that. And we said, we're going to have dignity in our lives. And one thing I should say about Penn Station is the death of Penn Station was the saving of Grand Central. Yes. Because that was the beginning of the landmarks. But not only that, the birth of Grand Central came from the birth of Penn Station because 
As I mentioned, the Vanderbilts were great rivals with the Pennsylvania Railroad, and when they saw what the Pennsylvania Railroad was building, they felt it was incumbent upon them to build something equal to that. So the magnificence of Grand Central really owes its being to the magnificence of Penn Station. So there's this long-standing relationship between the two of them. Right. And it's fascinating. It's absolutely true. We wouldn't have Grand Central today if it weren't for the landmarks laws that were triggered by the demolition of Penn. Um, but one of the things about Grand Central was Grand Central was built as a commuter terminal, right, because it didn't have national rail going through it. And it was meant as a sort of dignified way to get to what was really the nation's first transit-oriented development, this idea that you would take a train into the city, you wouldn't drive, and you could walk to your office building, and you'd do that all in a dignified manner, and that that actually created an extraordinarily powerful and valuable place for New York City uh, that was planned. We forget. I mean, Grand Central was all planned, Terminal City. Um, and so part of what I think the effort can be now, our proposal is basically that Madison Square Garden needs a new home. They've moved several times. It was in a McKinney and White building in Madison Square. Um, and uh, it, it, it needs a new facility. I think it would move under the right circumstances. Uh, but one of the struggles is how do you afford a new station if the garden moves? And how do you build that station given the magnitude of people going on underneath, going underneath it? So what Jill showed you was this idea that we had which was to recycle the garden, to strip off the ugly skin uh, and save its roof structure and foundations uh, and basically reclad it as a kind of commuter pavilion that would sit next to Farley as the, the national tra you know, train travel uh, station. Um, and we could do that much more economically and much more uh, kind of uh, expeditiously than building a brand new station, which as we know from the World Trade Center and other places could be very, very expensive. Um, and so the Times asked us to look at that, and that's how we ended up presenting what we presented. So we're still, we've got our fingers crossed. We're going to launch a campaign uh, w with uh, s the support of some foundations and so forth and want to um, keep advocating for that idea as the next step after Moynihan. So I think the idea was to take some questions from the audience, and I think we were going to do two or three. So I don't know who has, okay, so may you choose who you want to, Hi, uh, I was, as part of uh, your presentation, you noted that the air rights uh, above Penn Station, the Pennsylvania Railroad couldn't afford to keep them, and that's why the uh, station was torn down. How can the city nowadays afford to uh, leave, to get rid of all the economic activity at, uh, Madison Square Garden and the office towers around Penn Station, just so then we can bring in a sense of dignity. Well, I'm not the person to answer that because I'm the historian. So, <laughs> <laughs> so actually, uh, uh, it's a great question, but our intention is absolutely the reverse, which is that the garden moves nearby so that economic activity stays. Um, the garden could actually even move into the back of the Farley building, but there are other sites that can go nearby. Um, but that that, that that change in the station would actually trigger a lot of change in that neighborhood uh, and bring about the same kind of transit-oriented. The fundamental issue is people from Connecticut and Westchester, they take a train into Grand Central, they walk to their office building. People from New Jersey and Long Island tend to come into Penn Station, go through a horrible scrum, and transfer to the subway to get to their final destination. What would be great is if that neighborhood around Penn was a destination and not a place you wanted to get the hell out of as soon as you arrived in. Um, and, and that's really the issue today is that it's not a destination. It should be a center of economic activity with a great station at its heart. The uh, new tunnels proposed to come in south of Penn Station and that would be the new high-speed line for Amtrak. How are you going to deal with that? Because that moves it down to 30, uh, from the 33rd to 31st, moves it down to 30th Street. How would you deal with that with the new station? So th those tracks would come in, it's called Penn South, it would come in 
uh, on the block just below Madison Square Garden. And so those riders would actually come into this transit pavilion that we're talking about because it, it's between 7th and 8th, so it'd be hard to access Farley. So they'd be coming into this new station that Jill just showed you. But if it got built. Right block. Yes, you'd come, you'd come underneath 31st Street and into that station. Uh, you're underneath 33rd Street today when you're on the Long Island Railroad Concourse. So uh, how are we doing for time? Okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, could you just address this new tunnel that's being built from Grand Central to supposed to connect with Penn Station? Is that going to be something that will be part no. of? No. Oh, okay. I actually can tell you yeah. about this because I asked oh, the long today when I was. I should yeah. say, yeah. So um, the idea was that the the Long Island Railroad commuters who are actually going to the east side or in the vicinity of Grand Central would go straight to Grand Central. That would be an option. That tunnel was supposed to be open now. And so I asked today, I said, whatever happened with that? So apparently the original contractor realized this was like more than he realized. So it had to be recontracted out to a number of different uh, people. That took two years. Uh, the cost is now doubled and the uh, expected completion date is 2022, whereas the Moynihan train hall is supposedly um, on track, in budget, on time, as, as of today, and opening in 2020. So, and, and it would be interesting, I mean, I, I think no one will know until that tunnel opens how much of the Long Island Railroad commuter traffic gets siphoned off into Grand Central. I mean, Time will tell, but. Is that a good thing, or would, would be that a good thing to? Well, I mean, it's, it's a good thing just because it's, a, you know, offers more alternatives. It, it gives you the option. Change the, the direction of the state, the, the work that's being done on the morning. No, at, that, the two are not connected at, at all in the sense of, you know, one is being done by one set of people and the other is being done by another set of people, but obviously not at any, at, you know, with many problems. Apparently it's technically a very difficult project, which is not surprising knowing what you know <laughs> about what happened on the, under the East River. That, those tunnels were hellish, so. Uh, these new tunnels that are going to connect New Jersey to Manhattan, right? Are they for passenger trains or freight trains or both? It would be very nice to, instead of all those long haul trucks coming down into Manhattan, coming through the Bronx, coming down to Manhattan, unloading in the middle of the night, if one of those tunnels was dedicated for cargo, like, like they should be, and coming through New Jersey, which has a lot of nice roads coming right to that area and under the, t under the river, and coming into Manhattan. How about it, I, I know Mr. Architect? About, uh, so the, the, the gateway tunnels, the two tunnels that we were just referencing, are meant for passengers. Congressman Nadler has been pushing for a separate rail freight tunnel uh, from New Jersey to Red Hook for a, you know over a decade now. So. So, uh, question is this. Uh, so, I get the whole thing with Moynihan Station, but in reality, all they're building there is a mall, which is. Well, no, the they're same calling mall. it a hall because. No, no, well, it's a mall. Well, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. It's a mall. Okay. And they're building another mall at, um, on the west side. So, and the thing I don't understand, though, is that we're building all these malls and they're building these beautiful stations, which is great. I mean, I agree, it needs dignity, but the reality is that the Pennsylvania Railroad built that station as a crowning accomplishment of their railroad. Now we're building a station to put on a crown on top of a pile of, you know what? I mean, the tracks are awful. So, I mean, it's really, the real issue is not the station. The real issue is the ability to use the tracks, which are a disaster. So the other th thing is, if you look at places like Hong Kong, and we were talking about transit-oriented development. If you look at a place like Hong Kong with the MTR, 
That's actually a private company. It's the best transit system in the world. It's a private company. They build the tracks, they build the transit, and they are a developer. So they can therefore create um, economic wealth and the state doesn't have to pay anything. It's all done privately and they make a profit and it has a 99% on time arrival rate. So if we're actually building a real system, not just another mall, which is what Manhattan seems to build all the time is indoor malls, um, we're actually building a real system where the private company is paying for it and making a profit and the Hong Kong government is also making a profit because it's a private company. So, and they're making money off of their uh, shares. So I don't understand why we're not doing that in New York, why we're waiting, for the gov waiting around for the government to build something that they're clearly not gonna build. So I am not in any way a rail expert, but I have to admit I've never heard of a, of a private railroad that makes money, so I, I don't know what to say. The MTR, the MTR is a private company in Hong Kong. It does make money, but it makes money off of development, not off the railroad. It's not off of fares. They make money off of they make money off of land development around the stations. Right. And it, it's it, it and that actually is sort of the, look. I mean, what what Jill just described was private interest doing what they did, and and private interest built Grand Central, including a lot of the development around it. Um, but I think we live in a different era. And I mean, the pr part of the problem is like all the infrastructure, it, it's a, I think the comparison with Hong Kong is just a little unfair because these are systems that are being built now, right? And um, the, you know, the extensions that are done, you know, we read about 250 kilometers of new subway line in Shanghai and all of that stuff. We are living with legacy systems, right? And so m m most of our systems are built we already have existing gauge track and all sorts of other things that we have to deal with. And most of those are under the auspices of the government. So Moynihan's being built as a public-private partnership, which is, I, I think the mall characterization is a little unfair, uh, but there's a lot, you're, you're right, there's a lot of private development, but that's how they're helping to pay for the station. So the, they're sort of doing what you're asking. Oh, well, you're new, well, okay, sorry. right. So you're saying the infrastructure, and and this is very true. And I mean, there are a number of people somewhere in this audience who work in this world who are Amtrak people or were Amtrak people, and probably could really speak to what you're saying because they are very concerned at how under uh, invested we are in this absolutely essential infrastructure and how much has to go into it to make it workable and safe and have this capacity. So, I mean, there's just billions of dollars of backlog. Um, that's hard to argue with. And in fact, there's some people who say that Vishan should not be worrying about having a lovely station because that money needs to go to just honestly having a, a bigger capacity and, but, yeah, and, and I so, know, and, 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 let Sean answer imagine that. Imagine if Alexander Kassat thought that, that, <laughs> thought that way. Let's build the tunnels, let's build the tracks, but to hell with the station, right? I mean, wh when did we get to a world where we have to make choices like that? You know, that's what I don't understand. This is because having worked in government, I know everyone is fighting over breadcrumbs, right? And that's what creates that mentality. And that's right. why they don't plant trees, because by the time they get to that, it's so, like... Yeah, right. That tree so, budget, you know, tree budget right. is the first thing to go. Right, right. exactly. So, Which is why trees have to be seen as essential to public health and green infrastructure and so forth. So I, that's why I plugged it into this uh, <laughs> talk. But I agree with you. I mean, it's, it is good to aspire to beauty. And it's very necessary to the human spirit. One name that uh, has what? not been mentioned up there, uh, Governor Chris Christie. Oh. Where would we be? You can take this question. <laughs> Where would we be? It's election day. We, yeah, well, I mean, you know, had he, he not stepped in to, um, you know, mollify the Tea Party, future voters for his presidential run, the, there would be tunnels opening next year, new tunnels. Yeah. I mean, I, I do th think that that is the worst thing he did, and it doesn't begin to get enough attention. 
I mean, it was just a monumental disservice to the entire region. I mean, hopefully it won't be a disaster. If we're very fortunate, the existing tunnels will hobble along while new tunnels get built. But I mean, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so last question, whoever has the microphone. Hi. Do um, either of you recall what happened to the direct rail link via the World Trade Center from Penn Station to JFK that Governor Pataki announced right after 9-11? Right after Not me. <laughs> but Sean, I bet you know. Uh, there are a lot of downtown interests pushing that direct, li direct rail link um, from the World Trade Center site to uh, Kennedy. I don't think, I think back in 2002, it had a price tag of about five or six billion dollars. And I, I just don't think they ever really identified the funding for it. Um, there are some people who believe that that money could have been better spent on the rail link than the train, the train station that's been built at the Trade Center. Um, and I still think that high-speed rail, I mean, a gentleman earlier mentioned high-speed rail coming into Penn South. Um, you know, there's a whole other alignment that says that high-speed rail could come through New Jersey, past Newark Airport, into the World Trade Center, and out to Kennedy. Um, you know, which is, because a lot of these regional airline flights that we have, these little 20 passenger planes are because they're connecting to rail hubs. And in Europe, it's very common for trains to come to airports to, to make those kinds of connections. So I, I think that's still a sort of viable option out there. I mean, I, again, we shouldn't have to choose between all these very necessary public goods. We should figure out a way to finance a number of them that make sense. So I think that's it. So thank you very much for coming on a rainy night. And I believe everyone is invited to uh, shift upstairs. I guess I'm going to go and sign books. Thank you, Vishan. It was lovely you, being here with you.